In this lecture, we're going to talk about activities one and two in the customer relationship management process. Activity one is collecting customer data. This is the first step in the CRM process. We want to construct a customer database. Um, a customer database contains all of the data that the firm has collected about its customers. The database is the foundation for all subsequent CRM activities. And we're, when we're collecting data on our customers, our database should include at minimum, this is the basic data that a customer database should, in, that should, should contain for a retailer. And the first thing is a transaction history. So when we're talking about our transaction history, some of the things we want to know about, when did our customers shop? What are their purchase dates? What did they purchase on that shopping trip? So the SKUs they purchased or the individual items. We want to know the price that they paid, the amount of profit that we made. And we also want to know um, if the purchase was part of a special promotion or did they buy it at regular price? So what was the scenario in which they purchased it? Now, a lot of this transaction history comes directly from our point of sale machines or our cash registers. Um, so this all kind of goes back to um, information systems and having an information systems uh, program or an information system structure in place so that our transaction data can be immediately captured and put into our database. And it's really easy to tie a lot of this into um, into a certain customer's account uh, if they use a credit card, maybe if we ask them for their phone number um, or if we ask them for their driver's license or if we ask them if they've purchased with us before for their name. Um, all of this helps tie all of this data together in a database. Uh, the second thing we want to make sure we have is our customer contacts. And so this isn't their contact information, but this is their contacts with us, the retailer. So we want to know about all interactions that the customers had with us. Um, we want to know, do they visit our website? And we can track that based on cookies. We want to know if they made any inquiries um, on our website. Did they comment? Did they send us an inquiry? Uh, did they send us an inquiry to a call center? Did they connect with us? We want to know about the comments made, their comments made on blogs and social media. Uh, we want to know if they've returned products to us, if they've called us. We want to know if we've contacted them in any way as well. So did we send them direct mail? Did we send them emails? Did they get a copy of our catalog? Um, have we made a personal sales call to their house? All of these are ways that the customer has, con has been in contact with the retailer. And so we want to capture that and keep track of that. A lot of retailers will capture customer preferences, and this can become really critical when we're trying to identify target customers for campaigns and promotions. So our customer preferences, this might be your favorite color, the brands you buy regularly, what type of fabric you like, what flavors you like, what your size profile is. All of this information can be used to upsell you in a retail store. If I am a sales associate and I can figure out what your favorite color is, it might help me identify items that I can recommend to you. If I know your favorite brands, I can offer you coupons for those brands to come in the store for different products that they offer. Think of Kroger's CRM program. When they spit out coupons at the end of your purchase, that's not random. They're tracking your preferences and they're selling to you based on those preferences. The last thing that you want to make sure you have is your demographic information. So this is our demographic and psychographic data about our customers. Um, retailers need to, to be able to combine, combine individual data and oftentimes create a household profile for a customer. Uh, so retailers will collect information from you such as your anniversary date, your birthday. They might co collect your pet's names. Right? So there's lots of information that they're going to collect from you. Maybe your spouse's name. They're going to ask you if you have children. Um, a lot of these are done on profile forms. Maybe when you set up an account on their website. Um, those security questions aren't just for security friends. They're used to collect a little bit of data about you as well. And so um, if you've ever been a regular at a store um, and you've gotten coupons in the mail or an email saying, happy birthday, here's a gift to you, happy anniversary, here's our gift to you, um, or hey, uh, Kimberly Roush, we noticed that your husband's birthday is coming up. Would you like to purchase something for him from our, from our establishment, from our store? Um, 
Collecting that demographic information allows the retailers to target in on each individual customer. And so that's everything that happens um, when we're collecting our customer database. So how do we get this data? Right. Uh, so we talked a little bit about how to get the transaction data because that's the easiest data to collect because it's usually often connected. Um, but how do we get everything else? How do we know what the customer's preferences are? How do we know when their birthday is? How do we know um, if they're married with children? Well, it's very easy, like I said, to collect it through online and catalog channels because customers have to provide information. Um, but in store, that collection can be difficult. Uh, so some of our stores, some stores offer credit cards to collect data or membership cards for warehouse stores, but for everyone else to collect all that other data, there are really five approaches to collecting data in stores. And the first is as simple as asking customers. Ask your customer when they walk into the store what their birthday is, if they're married, and collect that in the system. Um, retailers have been able to connect internet data with store data. So if you use a third-party credit card, and when I say a third-party credit card, I mean Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, right? Not a store credit card, but if you use a third-party credit card in the store, no data can be collected about you, right? In the store, if you swipe your credit card, you're not giving the customer, you're not giving the retailer any data about you, the customer. However, if that retailer has connected their systems between their two channels, that synergistic connection between the internet channel and the store channel, and you use the same credit card that you've used online with them in the past. So if you shop at Target or Walmart and you use the same credit card to make purchases on the internet channel as you do in the store channel, the systems can connect that credit card information and connect your data and therefore they can create an in-depth profile on you based on that data connection. A third way to collect information is to offer frequent shopper programs. Frequent shopper programs are fantastic to identify and collect information because every time you get a frequent shopper card, you have to fill out an information card. You have to give them all of your information and oftentimes they have questions on there that even though they aren't mandatory, consumers will fill out. Um, so that basic frequent shopper card or that loyalty program can identify and even then provide rewards for customers who patronize a retailer. Uh, but that frequent shopper card is great for collecting data. A newer method of collecting data to identify customers is using biometrics. Biometrics are human characteristics such as handprints, fingerprints, irises in your eyes or your voice, your vocal inflections can be can be used to identify you. Um, using biometric data uh, ensures that we're collecting data about a specific customer. So in some stores, customers can register their credit card with a fingerprint. And so when you check out, all you do is scan your fingerprint. Well, that fingerprint is automatically connected to your credit card data and makes the purchase. It makes it easier because it's a faster checkout and customers don't have to carry cards. It also helps a retailer make sure that the person who's buying it is the person, um, if, if someone returns a product, that the person who returned it is the person who bought it. So nowadays you might walk into a retailer when you make a return and they'll say, do you have your receipt? Or can I look up your credit card? Well, the future of retailing uses biometrics and if you just scan your fingerprint, they can look up your purchase history. Um, a lot of times, fitness centers and tanning beds, um, they're already using biometrics to identify customers when they walk in the door. They have you register your fingerprint the first time you go, and you use your fingerprint on subsequent visits to ensure that it really is you using that membership. So I want to know um, if any of you have have been using biometrics at a, at a retailer. Uh, what types of retailers have you used biometrics to be able to identify yourself to that retailer? So that's the first activity, collecting information about the customer. Now we're going to talk about that second activity, which is analyzing our customer data and identifying our target customers. So we've collected all this data and we spent a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort in collecting the data. So what do we do with it? Well, we analyze it. And two of our main objectives when analyzing customer data, okay, the first is to identify our best customer. Okay, so we want to look at our 
very best. And so when identifying our best customers, we look at how valuable that customer is to us, the retailer. How valuable are you to me? Because that's what I want. I want customers who are valuable to my establishment. And so we use a measure called customer lifetime value or CLV. Um, and CLV is the expected contribution from a customer to the retailer's profits over their entire relationship. So this is over the lifetime that the customer is shopping with the retailer. We want to analyze their expected contribution to identify whether or not they are our best customer. And so the only way we can really truly measure CLV is using past behavior. Um, so there's an example in your book on page 298 um, that we're going to look at. So that's for you to look at. Um, and if you look at that one, it can help you identify who the most valuable customer is. Okay, but we're going to look at an example um, on here um, for Susan and Brittany, who both shop at Target. Okay, uh, so let's look at their purchases over the last 12 months. We can see that Susan shops, um, let's see, 10 out of 12 months a year. So she's not shopping with us in June and July, but she's making purchases every other month. And they range from $10 to $50. Okay, now let's look at Brittany's purchases over the last 12 months. We noticed that she only shopped with us one time. Uh, she shopped with us in June and she spent $400. Okay, so we have Brittany who shopped once and spent $400. We have Susan who was in, let's say, 12 times and she spent $350. Now, my question for you, which of these customers, Susan or Brittany, has a higher CLV? What do you think? If you selected Brittany, you are incorrect. Susan actually has the higher CLV in this case. So when we're looking at who's the more valuable customer, Susan is our more valuable customer. Why is that? She spent less money. Isn't a customer who spends more money more valuable? Not always the case. The reason being is that Brittany, what we know about her is that she only purchased one time. So was she visiting from out of state? Did we have a piece of furniture on sale that she just had to have so she purchased it? Will she ever come back? We don't know. We don't know a lot about Brittany, but we know that she only shopped once in the last 12 months. When we look at Susan, we can see that she's purchasing 10 out of 12 months. She clearly likes our establishment. She's visiting regularly. What can we do with Susan as a customer? Well, we see that her purchases range from $10 to $50. So how can we turn her $10 purchase into a $20, $30, $40, or $50 purchase? We know that Susan is going to shop with us. And so we're hoping that we can encourage her to spend a little bit more every visit to increase her overall spend. But she's more valuable to us because she shops more often, she shops regularly, and we can increase her one time her purchases. With Brittany, she only shopped once. And so it's going to be much harder to get her to shop more often than it is to get Susan to spend a little more. So think about this. Who has a higher customer lifetime value? A customer who pays full price or a customer who pays a sales price? Who has a higher customer lifetime value? A customer who returns items or a customer who doesn't make any returns? Let me know what you think in the discussion forums. The second objective, the second method of analyzing these data and identifying our customers is to use analytical methods to improve our decision making. So retail analytics are applications of statistical techniques and models that seek to improve our retail decisions through the analysis of customer data. Um, and most of the time when we're analyzing our data and we're looking at our retail analytics, we use a process called data mining. And data mining is an information processing model. And we use that to discover insights into the buying patterns of our customers. And we use our database. And so when we're data mining, when we're digging for data, when we're looking and analyzing all the data that we've collected, and we're trying to identify which customers to target, there's three techniques that we let retailers often look at. And the first is a market basket analysis. And in a market basket analysis, what we do is we start looking at products that appear 
in a basket that a customer purchases during a single shopping trip. Okay. Um, this analysis can help retailers suggest where stores should place their merchandise and which merchandise they should promote together based on trends that show up in this data. Okay. So let's look at this example. Let's look at products that appear in a basket that a customer purchases during a single shopping trip. A retailer did a study a few years back and they were looking at what's purchased at the same time and they found that on weeknight evenings between the hours of 5 and 7 p.m. people purchased diapers and beer at the same time. It rung up in enough carts during that time period during those weekdays that the supermarket was able to identify a trend. And so they started purchasing, placing beer or beer products in the baby aisle. What does that tell us? Why does that make sense? Beer and diapers. Men were often stopping at the supermarket on their way home from work to pick up diapers and they also picked up a six pack of beer. So retailers tried to pair those items together in order to increase purchases. Why do bananas get placed in both the produce section and the cereal aisle? Why do tissues get placed in the paper goods aisle and in the cold medicine aisle? Why is bug spray in both the hunting gear and the household cleaning sections of the store? All of those pairings are because retailers have been able to analyze data and see that those items are bought at the same time. And so retailers place those items together to make it easier for people to make those purchases. Why does Kroger have ping pong balls in the paper goods aisle? What activity in Milledgeville suggests that ping pong balls and red solo cups should be purchased together? Ping pong balls aren't always found next to red solo cups, but they are in Milledgeville. What other random combinations have you seen while shopping? Think about the different things you see hanging in the aisles of the grocery store or your, your full line discount stores. Most of those pairings are together because retailers have completed a market basket analysis.